Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another beautiful day of life. We thank you for your word. And the world is in chaos and so many people are hurting. And Lord, we pray for uh, those innocent people in the midst of all this chaos in Ukraine. Um, just bless them. Uh, give them wisdom and guidance. Father, you know the end from the beginning. And so we put our lives into your hands. I ask that you would be with us tonight as we spend time together to talk and to share thoughts and to just to open your word. Just guide our thoughts and our minds and uh, send your spirit to convict us. Help us to see the personal uh, spiritual application of these things, not just how things are going out there, but um, how this, what this means to us in our hearts and our minds to prepare us uh, to meet you face to face. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So um, last, it wasn't last week, two weeks ago we got together and I shared the, the point that I was trying to get across was that history is a prophecy. All history is a prophecy, not just the prophetic parts of Daniel, but also, his, also the historical parts of Daniel. And so I shared this, this lineage, this timeline um, scenario that was going with you uh, in Daniel. It began, it began back, back in 1 Kings 13. It talks about an evil king who corrupts true, true worship. And I showed the parallel between what happened before Daniel from Daniel's time, 1 Kings 13 up to Daniel, and the parallel of what, happened, what happens in terms of um, the dark ages and us. And so this is what this is, kind of a quick review. So there's an evil king who corrupts true worship. Uh, there's a prophecy of the restoration of true worship. Um, and then, of course, there's an age of darkness because um, this false king is casting truth to the ground, exalting false worship. So there's a lot of darkness and chaos, and the word of God is lost. Uh, but the time prophecy is fulfilled. Uh, God is going to bring the, king, the boy King Josiah as well. He's going to bring uh, a messenger at the time, at the end of the time, the fulfillment of the time prophecy. And the book of the law is found, which shines light and sh shines light into the darkness. And then, of course, there's a prophetess that comes on the picture that explains uh, the revelation of God's law and what's going on. And this prophetess tells us, prophesies of coming judgment that's to come uh, on the world because of the choices that they've made. Along with this, uh, there's this cleansing of the temple message of returning to true worship, taking away of those things that were false and re restoring of those things that were true to the word of God. So the restoration of true worship, the restoration of Ten Commandments, and the, the removing of, of anything that's pagan or non-biblical uh, from uh, worship from the church, from the temple, which is supposed to be obviously our challenge to do the same thing for us ourselves because we are temples of the living God. And I like this little picture here of, I think it's Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and, and Daniel, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel, to say their correct names. Uh, the four little boys that are being taught from the book of the law, and that this happens dur during Josiah's reforms, and this is what prepares them for the coming crisis. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we're supposed to be training ourselves, teaching ourselves from the book of the law to understand God, God, who he is, and to have his law written on our hearts and our minds. And that will prepare us for the coming crisis. Um, so these are some of the reforms that were, were brought into existence. Now, the prophecy says both the Church of Philadelphia and Revelation 3.10, and also for 2 Kings 22, for Josiah and uh, the people in his time that they're not going to see the disaster or revelation three says that you'll that the, you'll not see the hour of trial that's coming on the earth that they're actually going to go, go to sleep before that place and of course we know that that's true our founders have gone to sleep but then the next thing that happens is that egypt conquers god's people and um and then after egypt conquers god's people then daniel 1 1 takes place and then the king of the north conquers God's people. And I share with this, this with you because this is significant. Um, and this is kind of where I want to focus at tonight. There's, there's a lot of things in this timeline that we could focus on as prophetic to see where we are and how this has affected us. But I really want to focus on uh, the, this idea of the king of the south conquering God's people before the king of the north conquers God's people. Because, because we as Adventists have spent so much time focusing on the papacy and the king of the north that we have not paid attention to uh, the king of the south. And we have not seen 
you know, the impact of the King of the Soul, which is why we've been confused about where we are and why the end hasn't come yet, when actually the end is happening right around us and we don't realize it. So um, that's what I wanted to share tonight, the pattern of the prophecy of Daniel 1. And, and this is, so we're going to be talking about the King of the South mainly, but uh, when you talk about the King of the South, you're also talking about the King of the North. And when you talk about the King of the North, you're talking about the King of the South. And that's one of the things that I want to kind of share with your thinking. Uh, here's a, uh, a couple quotes from Mrs. White, just so that we realize we're not losing our mind. She says that, uh, that it is time for a great change to take place among the people who are looking for the second appearing of their Lord. She says, soon strange things will take place and God will hold us responsible for the way we treat the truth. So I don't know uh, if things need to get stranger for us to see that this ha is happening, but um, she says again here, in the future, strange things will happen. I tell you this so that you may not be surprised at what takes place. We shall all need to maintain a close connection with the Lord. The end is much nearer than when we first believed. So she warns us ahead of time that strange things were taking place. And I think, I believe that we're living in those times where we're seeing strange things happen, things that we would never believe could have happened before. And so uh, this is uh, my page. I'm putting work on it's the king. It says the king of the south. But you'll notice um, I'm focusing on the king of the south, but hidden in the title is um, the king of the north. So... I really want to focus our attention on the King of the South because we have focused so much attention on the King of the North, but the two are connected. And I, I just really want to kind of drive that point home and we'll see the, the importance of it, hopefully. So this is actually a blurry map, sorry, of the Middle East and the Fertile Crescent. And I want to explain the literal North and literal South, where these terms come from. So you can see... Uh, this is uh, a map. You can see where Jericho is. That's, that gives you an idea of where Israel is. And then you see Mesopotamia to the north, the Tigris and Euphrates. And then you see the Nile down here to the south. And you'll notice it's a fertile crescent because it goes across the top of the desert. And then it goes north and south when you come to, to God's people. And then, then Egypt is to the south. Now, why this is significant is because this actually, if you remember when on the Exodus, they traveled the King's Highway, there was literally a place called the King's Highway that went north and south, right by Jericho, right through that Jordan, that Jordan Valley. And it's called the Fertile Crescent because obviously if you have an army of any size, you're not going to march them through the desert because by the time they get there, obviously if they're still alive, they won't be ready to fight. So all the armies of the ancient world uh, that went south to fight with with Egypt would go down through this through the through the king's highway through through Israel, right? And they would come from the north and they would go down through. And then, of course, anytime Egypt wanted to go to war with anybody in the north, they would come up through the king's highway and they would come up from the south. So you can see here the next one that uh, Babylon and Mesopotamia and Nineveh, which is Assyria. Um, Meta Persia, all these countries, they're going to go. They're going to go down up the Fertile Crescent and come down from the north, down the King's Highway to go south. And Egypt is going to come come up from the south to go north. And this is where the King of the North and the King of the South comes from. Okay. Also, mm -hmm. I just want to pay pay attention. I don't know if we'll, maybe we'll get to the story of Abraham tonight. Um, but you'll notice also uh, when you look at this map, Egypt is south. But also Paran is south and Edom is south. So um, Edom is considered the part of the south. Um, that's going to be important. Like, for example, if you're trying to understand the book of Malachi, uh, it'll talk about Edom first. It's Many of the books of the Bible are not set in the context of the king of the north. They're set in the context of the king of the south. Malachi is one of those books. Um, it starts out, Malachi starts out with talking about Esau and Edom and how, how Edom, Esau keep continually rebelled against God. And then God is using that to talk to Malachi, to the children of Israel, to Malachi, because the children of Israel are following the uh, Edom and the king of the south uh, concepts. So, you know, of course, Joel is the same thing. Joel is written in the context of the king of the south. But if you're... Um, 
if you like ha the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk um, in Habakkuk 3, it says God came from, from Teman, he comes from, and his glory comes from Paran. Um, Teman is the, actually the literal, literal word for south is Yemen, and that's where Teman comes from. And also the word Paran is, comes from the south. So um, it also means the right hand. But so you see in this map, you can see the idea again, the king of the south and the king of the north. These are literal, these are literal directions. And the armies would come from literally from the south and literally from the north. So the king of the south is Egypt, and the king of the north is Babylon. Or a, if you're in Medo Persia time, it's Medo Persia. Um, the Romans, the same thing, they came from the north. So these are all armies that come from the north. And, and Egypt comes from the south. So you can see from this that Egypt is the king of the south. And this is what is happening in 2 Kings 23, verses 29, 35. This is when Pharaoh Necho comes north to fight against, uh, he actually is going to Carchemish to fight against Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and that's when Josiah goes out to meet him. And of course, Josiah is killed. And this is when Pharaoh Necho takes um, Jeconiah, brings him to Egypt, and then he takes Eliakim changes his name to Jehoiakim, and he puts him on the throne of Israel. So Jehoiakim in Daniel 1.1, when you read that uh, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Jehoiakim is a puppet king of Egypt. He's, he's placed on the throne by Pharaoh Necho, and he's a vassal king to Egypt. So the same thing when you get to Daniel 11, and he talks about the king of the south, um, Three times in the discourse of Daniel 11, he specifically describes he, Egypt as the king of the south. So he will say Egypt. Um, so Egypt is the king of the south, literally the king of the south. And of course, it's going to become spiritual later. But And then, of course, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon is the king of the north, always. Um, and again, you can look at Assyria as the king of the north or mm -hmm. Medo-Persia or others. That's fine. But there, that's the king of the north. So the king of the north and the king of the south, God's people are always caught in the middle. They're caught in the crossfire. Uh, it's very interesting that God's a troublemaker. He purposely put his people in the middle. And so that way, when the king of the north wants to do what, do what he does, or the king of the south wants to do what he does, they have to go through God's people. They have to go through the middle. So, so God's people were put in the center actually to be an influence for both. And of course, instead of what happens, they end up caving in and becoming part of what they shouldn't be doing. But anyways, God put us in the middle of the conflict on purpose because we're supposed to shine light to people in darkness, uh, even though that's not historically what happened. So Daniel 1, 1 begins that God's people, according to 2 Kings 23, 34, um, Pharaoh Necho conquers God's people, and for three and a half years, they're under the captivity of, of the king of the south, of Egypt. And it's in 605 uh, that's, that uh, king of the north, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, comes, and he conquers, uh, he conquers Egypt. He conquers Egypt, he conquers God's people. And he conquers God's people because God's people are part of Egypt. And that's important. So then in Daniel 1, you'll see there's going to be three and a half years of captivity. In Daniel 1, 5, Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah are going to be servants or in captivity for three years before they go before the king. And so there's the, the three, the, these two three and a half year thing. Now, this local literal is a type or a pattern. It's a prophecy uh, of the end time and the world anatype. Okay, so that's why we're talking about it. So when the king of the north conquers in Daniel 1, this is important. When the king of the north conquers in Daniel 1, verse 1, when Daniel 1, verse 1 begins, that's the beginning of the end. And it ends with, a, Daniel chapter 1 ends with the second coming of Christ. If you'll notice uh, Daniel 1, verse 27, it ends with the coming of Cyrus. And Cyrus is the anointed one. And according to Isaiah 41, he's literally called the Messiah. And he's the type of the second coming of Christ who sets God's, uh, captives free from Babylonian captivity. So Daniel 1 begins with the time of the end, the, the conquering, the king of the north conquering the king of the south and God's people. It ends with the second coming, so second coming of Christ. 
So Daniel chapter one mm -hmm. encompasses the whole, the whole process of the end, uh, which is why Daniel one is so significant in terms of the book of Daniel. And that's important. We'll, we'll, we haven't really got into Daniel one yet, but when we do, uh, you'll see that we'll spend a lot of time. There's, there's a lot there. So uh, this God's people, the three and a half years of captivity in under Egypt or under the king of the south, and then three and a half years of captivity under the king of the north is also this same pattern is given to us in Revelation. Um, the beast from the bottomless pit in Revelation 11, by the way, he's he's is called Egypt. Um, <clears throat> God's people are going to be um, under their... The holy city will be tread underfoot 42 months, it says. And then, of course, in Revelation 13, the beast from the sea, which is the papacy, uh, he is also going to uh, put take God's people in captivity uh, for 42 months. So the same three and a half times, three and a half years, you know, 42 months, the same imagery that you see in Daniel 1.1 1, 1 is reflected again in the book of Revelation, uh, which is important to understand uh, Revelation. So here the beast from the bottomless pit, Revelation 8, um, it says that um, <clears throat> it's given to the, it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city shall be trodden under foot 42 months. That's, that's Revelation 11 verse 2. But um, Ezekiel 30, when it talks about the Gentiles and Egypt, it calls it the time of the heathen. <clears throat> Jesus in Luke 21, 24 says it's the time where the Gentiles will be fulfilled. So the word, the phrase Gentiles in, in, uh, in Revelation 11 is connected to Egypt. Uh, you can see the same thing if you go to Jeremiah. If you go to Jeremiah 46, I don't have a lot of stuff I don't have on the slide, but if you go to Jeremiah 46, verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles, and then verse Two, it says, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Nico. So Jeremiah is writing the same way. He's writing against the Gentiles, and he says this is against Egypt. So the Egypt is, are considered Gentiles here in this phrase, and the same thing is going on in Revelation 11. And we'll bounce back and forth out of Revelation 11 here tonight. But So, but, so the point here is that the beast in the bottomless pit in Revelation 11 is Egypt. By the way, that's going to be important for you if you want to understand um, the fifth trumpet as well. Because uh, when you're in Revelation 11, of course, you're in the sixth trumpet. But the beast in the, bo the bottomless pit is open in the fifth trumpet. So you'll need to understand um, this. that's not Islam. Sorry, <clears throat> that's just not biblical. And, of course, the beast from the sea is a papacy in Revelation 13. Now, this is the same as... Daniel 11, 40, 45, through 45. In Daniel 11, of course, Daniel, the book of Daniel ends the same way it begins, uh, that the king of the north captures uh, the glorious land. And the glorious land, obviously, is a symbol of God's people in verse 41. But he captures the glorious land when he captures Egypt. Uh, that's verse 42 and verse 43. And this is because God's people are already slaves or um, bought into the Egyptian philosophy. Now, of course, here you've gone from the local literal in Daniel one one to to the typical to the antitypical to the worldwide. So, so this is where the king of the north and the king of the south become not literal countries anymore. They become philosophies, uh, mindsets. They become uh, social agendas that are being pushed. So the king of the north does end up conquering the king of the south. Um, and he ends up conquering God's people, and it happens at the same time. Now, Revelation also tells us, and Daniel 11 is also telling us, that what, what appears to be at odds, the king of the north versus the king of the south, actually becomes, they're synchronized into one. In Revelation 17, the harlot, who is the papacy, she rides a seven-headed dragon. The seven-headed dragon in Revelation 17 is specifically described as the, the beast coming from the bottomless pit. So that beast that she rides, and this is something that I've been trying to share. We've been confused on this for a while. The beast that she rides in Revelation 17, the seven-headed dragon, is not the papacy. The papacy is not riding the papacy. That makes no sense. 
okay? Uh, for years, uh, people have had that position because they think that the harlot is riding the beast of Revelation, the seven headed beast of Revelation 13. That's not true. The beast of Revelation 17 is the beast from the bottomless pit. That's the same beast that comes from the bottomless pit is Revelation 11. So the beast that she's riding, the seven headed beast, dragon in Revelation 17, is not the papacy. It's actually the king of the south. It's Egypt. It's the secular humanist philosophy. And the, har and the harlot herself is Babylon. So you see in Revelation 17 that, that what seemed like they were at odds with each other, they're actually working together. The, the fact that the harlot is riding the dragon means that she's, she's using the dragon as a seat of her authority, which means that they're working together. They're co-working together. By the way, you, you can see the same thing, the same thing in Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter 11. Um, you know, Daniel 11 says that they're, they sit at the same table and they speak lies to each other. And, you know, so the idea is that they're working together behind the scenes while they're convincing people that they're actually at odds with each other. So that's part of the deception. Now, from here, I have, there's 50 million places we could go. And, I, and I'm not sure, I wasn't sure who was going to be on and what questions you might have um, and where you want to go from this. So... There's, there's a couple ways we could go. First of all, I'd like to, to talk about how we, how God's church, God's people become part of the King of the South, become captive to the King of the South. I'd like to talk about that process. Um, it's, also, uh, it's also important to talk about how and why the King of the North, the healing of the wound is connected to the, to the conquering of the King of the South and how that wound is healed and what it, me what it means. Especially I'm interested in that because that's what's happening right now around us. Um, so there's many different aspects that I, we could take this. And I just wanted to kind of pause here.